Tonight we'll cover the latest in the UNM presidential run and water issues in Albuquerque. Also, where does New Mexico rank in the number of overdose deaths? All this and more on UNM News. The UNM Presidential Church Committee has come up with five finalists to replace President David Schmidley when he retires next summer. The five will all be on campus starting December 8th. Douglas Baker is currently a provost and executive vice president at the University of Idaho. Robert Frank is a provost and senior vice president at Kent State University. Meredith Hay is a special advisor to the Arizona Board of Regents. Elizabeth Hoffman currently is a provost and executive vice president at Iowa State University. And Elsa Murano is a professor and president emerita at Texas A&M University. The five finalists will be on campus weekdays from December 8th through the 12th. Each one will have an open forum for faculty and staff at 1045 in the morning. That will be followed by a forum for students at 1145 a.m. A new study conducted by the University of New Mexico determined that normal-looking tissues surrounding breast cancer tumors have similar characteristics to malignant tumors. The current surgery procedure to remove tissue surrounding the tumor causes recurrences. The American Cancer Society states that 10 to 20 percent of breast cancer survivors will suffer a recurrence. The new research shows that removing one centimeter of tissue around the tumor lessens the chances of leaving harmful tissue and reduces recurrences. Stephanie Hoover reported this story. She spoke with me earlier today. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you for joining us. Of course. What did the researchers discover in this new study? So, breast, uh, UNM breast cancer researchers found that uh, the tumor or the cells around tumors actually are predisposed to cause cancer. So, breast cancer sufferers are more likely to suffer a recurrence from these cells. Okay. So, can you just explain the current course of action um, for breast cancer patients? So basically the normal course of action for a breast cancer patient is to have a lumpectomy, which means they take out the malignant tumor and about two to five millimeters around that tumor as well. And um, what they found is that these two to five millimeters actually are predisposed to cancer cells. So they're proposing to take out about one centimeter or 10 millimeters now. Okay. And can you just explain that some more? Um the, that new course of action that they will be taking? Yeah, so basically they'll take out one centimeter now, which means there should be less chance of a recurrence. So that is obviously really good for breast okay. cancer patients. Thank you. And um, how did they discover this? Uh, they actually discovered this kind of accidentally. They were, sh uh, they were studying short telomeres and the correlation between a bad outcome with, for cancer patients. And uh, telomeres are actually the ends of cells and so when a cell naturally dies, telomeres grow smaller and smaller until the cell dies. But um, in cancer cells, they do something called, they create something called tel telomerase, and this causes the cell to become immortal. And they found this telomerase occurs as far as one centimeter out. Okay, and so what is their next step after this discovery? They're basically gonna do a proof of principle study now, which means they're gonna study 136 patients and a correlate between recurrences and how much tissue they take out. And assuming everything goes as planned, this should become a normal practice for breast cancer lumpectomies. Okay, thank you for joining us, Stephanie. Thank you. The Albuquerque climate creates water conservation issues for the city. Cyclical drought and ecological indifference has contributed to the depletion of the water supply in the aquifer. Water activists are looking for alternatives, and Paul Nicolin and Lindsay Douglas have more. Due to drought in Albuquerque, the city is concerned about the sustainability of its aquifer. Bruce Thompson, director of the Water Resources Program at UNM, explains what an aquifer does. An aquifer is a permeable soil beneath the ground. Uh, it can be a sandstone or, you know, semi-solid semi, uh, like a sandstone, but it's porous. Or it can be, as we have mostly in Albuquerque, it can be silts and clays and sands, it's sort of an, a mix. Um, but we, uh, it, it's kind of like forcing water into a sponge. You, you put it under pressure and, and the water will, um, will, will remain in, in the 
pore spaces. Leslie Weinstock, a member of the Agua S Vida action team, explains why this is an issue. So there, the reason they are proposing aquifer, they call it aquifer storage and recovery, the ASR, and they're, it, they're proposing aquifer storage and recovery because there's a drawdown of the aquifer because of the increase in population, because of the um, kind of unchecked development. In some of our wells, the water's been dropping 10 feet a year. And so clearly it was not sustainable. Um, what that means is that we were using water. We were taking water out of the aquifer more rapidly than it was being replenished. Weinstock urges citizens to be more aware of the ecology in Albuquerque. The people that are wise about ecology and watershed management would be knowing where the water go flows and how it flows and how to save it, how to store it, how to replenish and restore the aquifer naturally and restore the river naturally and not deplete it, steal it, pollute it, you know, all those things come into play with eco-literacy. There is a public workshop about protecting the aquifer happening on January 10th, 2012 at 6 p.m. at the Albuquerque Center for Peace and Justice. According to a recent study by the CDC, New Mexico ranks the number one state in the nation for drug overdose deaths. Anthony Roybal reports on this epidemic. A new report from the Center for Disease Control shows New Mexico leads the nation in fatal drug overdose deaths. John Steiner from the Campus Office of Substance Abuse and Prevention provides insight to this problem. Well, I think it's, it's part of the, the answer to that is our proximity to Mexico and uh, the fact that we are both a destination and a corridor for illegal drugs coming over the border. Um, Mexican black tar heroin is uh, one of those drugs that's caused its share of... Uh, overdose deaths. According to the survey, New Mexico has suffered 27 overdose deaths per 100,000 people, more than two times the national average. Since 1991, the overdose death rate has increased 242 percent. New Mexico has uh, also the uh, distinction of being a very rural and frontier uh, uh, population state, which means that uh, resources for treatment, prevention, uh, those things are a little harder to come by for a lot of folks in New Mexico. I would in New Mexico, it was estimated 250,000 of illicit drug users in New Mexico were between the ages of 12 and 17 years old. And, uh, you know, drug over death sometimes occur to folks who, uh, you know, maybe even the, the very first time that they've tried something, but more often for people who have become addicted, uh, particularly in the case of opiates, and um, for those folks, treatment and, and detoxification services are, are very, very important. Also, for UNM News, Anthony Roybal. Reporter Anthony Roybal joins us now. Well, Anthony, we're here to talk about some pretty tragic information now. You've reported that New Mexico is the number one state in drug overdoses. Why is that? It is due to because um, people have a uh, student people have a lot of money to spend on drugs and there's not a lot to do in New Mexico. So people, rather than positively benefiting their communities, they would rather spend their time getting high. What can be done from a legislative standpoint to kind of curb this epidemic? I feel more regulation can be done by uh, the DEA and more local governments and by regulating the pharmaceutical companies so that doctors aren't just prescribing medications without reason. And uh, one final question, you, you've actually been affected by this drug issues, not, not directly, but tell me about your experiences with classmates and whatnot in this, this issue of specifically heroin. Um, two of my friends this past weekend were killed, at the two people at TOX Park who were brutally beaten and then shot to death. Um, they were involved in some kind of drug activity and tragically they were both killed over it. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, well, thank you again for joining us. And no, thank you for having me. We'll be back right after this. Here at UNM News, we want to take a couple of minutes to acknowledge the changing season and the beauty it brings. 
UNM News reporter Baron Jones spent the early morning hours on the banks of the Rio Grande River at the Bosque del Apache Wildlife Refuge, about 80 miles south of Albuquerque, checking out the majestic sandhill cranes and the snow geese that call the Bosque home. Overhead, snow geese stirred by a predator take to the sky here at the Bosque del Apache Wildlife Refuge. The refuge is home to thousands of geese, crane, and other waterfowl who travel to the Bosque to hole up during the harsh winter months. Bird watchers and naturalists line the banks of the Rio Grande and during the early morning chill, all in hopes of experiencing the beauty and majesty of these migratory birds, specifically the Sandhill Crane. Camera shy refuge biologist Ashley Inslee explains why cranes and company flock to the region. We've got a continuous 10 mile stretch of river and riparian corridor that these animals can access for roosting, for feeding, for uh, loafing, for everything that they need to do. The big draw for the bird watchers is the big fly out, which doesn't seem to be happening this morning. When they leave here during the day, they're going out to um, around here a lot of farm fields, but they're going to go feed and to go loaf and mm -hmm. just rest during the day. And then they'll come back here and the reason they choose these open areas to roost in the evening is for security, safety reasons, safety mm -hmm. in numbers. Um, but they'll go out and they'll form their little pair bonds and, and usually they have their chick or if they had um, two chicks, mm -hmm. they'll stay together in their little family group in the day, go feed mm -hmm. and then come back. This is Baron Jones reporting for you news from Bosque del Apache. The UNM Quiz Strait Alliance hosted their third annual drag show on November 18th at the Student Union Building's main ballroom. Megan Eichhorn and Lindsay Douglas reporting. UNM's Queer Strait Alliance's third annual drag show took over the Student Union Building ballroom on November 18th to showcase the many talents of drag kings and queens. The theme was the year Queer Thousand, and there was no shortage of lights, sequins, or sparkles to complement it. Let's get ready to rumble! The show's MC was a big hit with the crowd and also performed. <laughs> Frankie Swift was crowned Drag King, and a mini delight was crowned Drag Queen. The show was received well by the audience. The only hiccup was a crowd member running off with the MC's wig, but it didn't seem to put a damper on the mood. Animals, skulls, and devils. That's what internationally known mask maker Felipe Horta shared with the UNM community. Horta held a workshop at the Latin American and Iberian Institute to share his mask making talent. Katie Fosterling has more. UNM's Latin American and Iberian Institute hosted internationally known masquero Felipe Horta. Horta who is very primos. recognized here in, in the United States. Were From Michoacan, Mexico, he's been designing and carving his own masks for occasions Felipe, around the world that, since he was 12. He's a wonderful artist and has been a wonderful and important teacher for me. Uh, Brought here by longtime uh, friend as well as UNM postdoctorate Pavel Schlossberg, Felipe shared his Mascheto experiences and travels around the U.S. and Mexico. Since 1992, Felipe has shown his craft at demonstrations and workshops at cities around California, Montana, Arizona, Wisconsin, New Mexico, and mainly Mexico. This is for fine arts for Mexico. This was a, uh, the fine arts uh, institution. Want, you know, asked them to make masks. Well. Designing masks for traditional dances, festivals, as well as decorative purposes, Felipe's masks represent anything from death and evil by carving skulls and the devil to typical people through animals. Somebody's converting into a rat there. <laughs> Felipe indulged the audience with his extravagant mass along with lavish costumes to perform some traditional dances. For UNM News, I'm Katie Fosterman. 
That wraps up this edition of UNM News. Thank you for joining us. For Miriam Belim and myself, Adam Camp, you've been watching UNM News. Have a wonderful remaining semester and happy holidays to all of you.